Lower back pain is one of the most common complaints leading to office visits, and in this video, I'm going to teach you an approach to low back pain, when imaging is indicated, and some of our initial management of back pain. So one of the first things that we do with back pain is we actually define uh, the duration of the symptoms as acute, subacute, or chronic. Acute is typically defined as less than four weeks in duration, while subacute is four to 12 weeks, and chronic is greater than 12 weeks. Part of the reason that we care about this is that it does guide us a little bit in terms of when to get imaging, and also some of the treatments for acute versus subacute and chronic do differ a little bit. However, what I really want to emphasize and what I really want you to know is that regardless of when the patient presents, you know, whether they're acute or subacute or chronic back pain, you need to do the same risk assessment. And that kind of takes us down two paths. Do they have red flags or do they not have red flags? This is because if there are any red flags present, then the patients should go immediate imaging. Whereas if there's no red flags pre present, then we start with conservative therapy, generally for a four week trial. So what are some of the red flags that we're looking out for? So the first one is going to be things that kind of uh, tip you off towards possible cauda equina syndrome. So that's gonna be new onset urinary retention, uh, bowel incontinence, as well as neurologic deficits. And one thing I wanna emphasize here is this urinary retention. A lot of people just say bowel or bladder incontinence, mistakenly leading people to think that urinary incontinence is the most common way for people with cauda equina syndrome to present. However, what's actually more common is urinary retention. And what happens over time is if you have so much retention, um, you can eventually develop overflow incontinence, which can lead to the incontinence sy symptoms. But what you're actually initially going to be looking for is that urinary retention, not incontinence. The next thing we need to be on the lookout for is any signs of infection. And so the red flags here are going to be fever, immunosuppression, current or recent bacteremia, IV drug use, endocarditis, indwelling venous catheter, or a recent spinal procedure. And the last major bucket that we have here is risk factors for cancer. So any patients with a current or recent cancer history are considered high risk. And then some lower risk factors that uh, we may have is age greater than 50 with unexplained weight loss or failure to improve with conservative management. So again, this is going to be the higher risk factors, and these are going to be the lower risk factors here. So in these patients here, we recommend an immediate MRI as well as uh, urgent subspecialty evaluation. And then for the last bucket of the cancer patient, you know, patients at risk for cancer, typically what's recommended is a plain radiograph plus an ESR and CRP. Other things that are not necessarily red flags per se, but kind of raise my eyebrow a little bit would be things like midline back tenderness. So typically patients with uh, non-specific low back pain will have more of a spinal, paraspinal uh, back tenderness, whereas midline back tenderness may make you think a little bit more of maybe uh, a cancer as an etiology, infection, or fracture. So these are things that uh, would cause really point tenderness right on the vertebral level. And then other things would be night pain or pain that wakes from sleep. So um, typically nonspecific back pain is going to be worsened with movement and it's not really going to cause people to wake up in the middle of the night, but things like cancer pain, infection, those are things that are going to be painless regardless and can wake you up even while you're sleeping. And then any patient with a uh, you know trauma history or history of fractures in the past, age greater than 65 with osteoporosis or chronic glucocorticoid use, those are all risk factors for fractures, in which case imaging may be uh, needed more urgently as well. Okay, so these are not really my specific flags, but these are kind of orange flags right here. Uh, so things to make you kind of pause a little bit and consider whether earlier imaging might be necessary. So one of the questions this might bring up is why are we so judicious and picky with when patients get imaging or not? And why don't we just order imaging for all patients because you know, patients generally want to have some kind of imaging to look into it. So why no imaging? So the reason is kind of twofold. So number one is that the vast majority of low back pain resolves on its own. 
And because of that, it's much more effective to just try a, a trial of conservative therapy for four weeks instead of getting a lot of imaging for every patient, um, especially when all sorts of false positives and other things um, might show up. And so that's the second point here is that there is a very high false positive rate and a lot of patients um, may have findings on their imaging that does not correlate with what's actually causing their, their pain. In general, imaging is just very nonspecific, so you may get imaging and find a bunch of incidental findings, uh, you know, narrowed foramina and, uh, you know, osteophytes, things like that, which is not, not actually the explanation for their lower back pain. So this is the two main reasons that imaging upfront is not recommended for no, most patients. And just to kind of clarify with you um, that 90% of patients are gonna fall into this no red flag group, whereas only 1% of patients are gonna have this, uh, you know, concern for cauda equina, infection or cancer, and then the other five to 10% may have kind of ridiculous back pain. So that's why we say for red flags, you're usually gonna see that less than 1% of the time. All right, so moving on to conservative therapy, what is our initial management gonna be? Well, this kind of is going to vary whether you are in that acute sub-bucket or you're in that subacute or uh, chronic bucket. And in terms of acute and subacute, some of the uh, recommendations are similar between both groups. In both cases, non-pharmacologic therapies are preferred. We advise against bed rest because patients who are lying in bed all day actually tend to start having worsening pain. And in fact, we actually encourage people to continue staying active. So going up to that limit of where their pain is and then gradually increasing that activity as tolerated. Um, and so there should be very minimal activity modification for most patients. Other non-pharmacologic therapies that are recommended include superficial heat rather than cold, um, acupuncture, massage therapy, as well as um, spinal manipulation therapy. And finally, getting into our pharmacologics, then we're going to start recommending uh, NSAIDs. And we try this for a period of two to four weeks. And this is actually um, something important to note is that Tylenol is not recommended. So not Tylenol because they've done some very high quality studies um, which have showed that Tylenol had no benefit over placebo. And the guidelines actually do recommend a trial of skeletal muscle relaxants if needed for a short duration. This is not really my favorite medication to give because it really just tends to make people sleepy. Um, so again, we do it for a limited duration. Uh, in the chronic side of things, they do have some recommendations that if there's persistent or disabling pain, that they can be continued long term. But uh, I think in my personal experience, recommending these long term is not very beneficial for patients because it contributes to them being more sleepy, lying in bed more often and not moving as much, which is really probably one of the most effective uh, treatments for low back pain, which is actually increasing your activity. In terms of acute uh, low back pain, we do not routinely refer to uh, PT or exercise therapy, unless they have risk factors for developing subacute or chronic low back pain, or they have really low uh, functional status that's gonna limit their activity. And finally, the guidelines state that there is a limited role for opioids. Really, this is for people who have really intractable pain, despite uh, their uh, NSAIDs and muscle relaxants. And um, if you do prescribe it, you should really only do a three to seven day course uh, maximum. So in terms of the subacute and chronic phase, you know, all of this stuff up here in the orange is pretty much the same treatment that we would recommend for acute low back pain. But some of the differences is that we do recommend exercise therapy uh, and physical therapy. We also recommend a lot of mind body therapies uh, because there's a very close link between the mind and chronic pain because people start to get this kind of central sensitization of their pain. So things like cognitive behavioral therapy, biofeedback and mindfulness uh, based stress reduction. Those are all things that we recommend for patients. And in general, you may need to start doing uh, multidisciplinary interventions, which um, kind of includes doing both exercise therapy, physical therapy, and those psychologic uh, interventions as well. So most multidisciplinary rehabilitation. In terms of other medications, uh, this is where you may start 
you know, starting to recommend patients can trial um, SNRIs like duloxetine or even TCAs, which are kind of treatments that can modulate that kind of chronic pain response and also have some benefit uh, psychologically if there's a, a component of depression that's contributing. Again, long-term opioids are not recommended uh, because there has been very poor evidence to show that they improve quality of life and very poor evidence to show that there's in improved outcomes in terms of uh, improving functional status. So long-term opioids not recommended. But obviously the big problem is that a lot of these patients have already been on opioids for a long time and it's very hard to wean them off of it. But in general, you should not start long-term opioids and you should just continue de-escalating opioids for patients who are already on them. This is also where you're going to start thinking about surgical and non-surgical interventions. So typically surgery should only really be indicated if they are having long-term symptoms over a year and with persistent disability or decrease in functional status. And then there is obviously, you know, only certain indications for getting surgery. For example, if they have really bad degenerative disc disease or a lumbar disc herniation or some kind of severe radiculopathy or spondylolisthesis, um, those are going to be reasons to pursue surgery. But in general, we're not going to really be considering this until very, you know, long down the line. There are some reports of early surgery uh, showing improved outcomes at like the six month and 12 month mark. But then once you go down to the two year, three year mark, the outcomes are actually the same. So there's really not a huge benefit to doing early surgery. So uh, again, really just trying to maximize all those non, uh, non-surgical interventions because we know that surgery is a very high morbidity um, kind of intervention requires a lot of rehab. And the efficacy, at least from my perspective, is really mixed. So in a lot of these patients, it's not clear if surgery is actually going to be able to fix their problem. So consider after one year. And then non-surgical is really going to be kind of um, epidural steroid injections is going to be our major one. So epidural steroid injections definitely can cause some short-term benefits. Uh, usually it's thought to be only like a few months, like three months, six months maybe. Um, but I've definitely had some patients who really felt like it you know, worked for a very long time for them, like over a year. Uh, in general, though, uh, we do consider it as kind of more of a short-term relief than anything. Other things you should definitely start thinking about is referring to a chronic pain specialist. And there's also these things called spinal cord stimulators, which also have very mixed evidence. There's a lack of consistent benefit in the trials. And obviously, there's a high infection risk uh, with these devices. So obviously, this is something you should be very hesitant to consider, but it is an option if patients are really having that intractable pain and are wanting to try something else. All right, and now that we've started our patients on treatment, what is our next steps gonna be? So generally, we are going to reevaluate them in four weeks to see if they've improved. If there's been no improvement, then we can consider imaging at this stage. So consider imaging if they have signs of radiculopathy um, or if they have uh, low risk factors for cancer, you know, those those risk factors that we talked up uh, about up here. And the last one is going to be kind of like concern for spondyloarthritis or spondyloarthropathies. And then important to note is that the patients who you're considering for uh, radiculopathy or stenosis symptoms, these should only be patients who are likely candidates for surgery and who are actually interested in surgery. So if they're not really a good surgical candidate, say they're 90 years old, they have a bunch of medical comorbidities, or they're just not interested in surgery, then imaging probably is not really going to change management. So you don't really need to consider that. But uh, what they do recommend after this is that if patients don't have any of these uh, you know, reasons to consider imaging at four weeks, then you proceed to continue treatment uh, for another two months uh, for a total of 12 weeks. And so uh, at this point, you're going to reassess them at the three month mark. And uh, if they still have not improved at this point, then they do recommend getting a plain radiograph and consider referrals for further evaluation. I did want to bring up some useful things to know for you guys. So there's something called the waddle signs, which are signs of non-organic causes of back pain. Um, and so this would be tenderness, which is uh, just superficially on the skin and tender to light touch or non-anatomic deep tenderness, not localized to one area. Uh, simulation. So if you just kind of uh, push down on somebody's head and that causes back pain, that's kind of a non-organic cause of back pain. Uh, and then rotating at the uh, shoulders and the pelvis, if that causes pain, that's also non-organic. 
uh, distraction. So if there's differences in your straight leg, uh, you know, testing based on how you perform it, then that would be non-organic. And then regional weakness that doesn't make anatomic sense, or if there's like cogwheeling or kind of giving way sensation, that would again be suggestive of a non-organic uh, weakness. And um, overreaction by the patient, like disproportionate amount of pain, uh, is also a one of the Waddle signs. In terms of the diagnostic imaging, here is a nice table from uh, the ACP, which kind of shows that patients who require immediate imaging, you're going to do plain radiography plus ESR for patients with major risk factors for cancer, and MRI for any patients with risk factors for spinal infection, cauda equina syndrome, or otherwise having severe neurologic deficits. In terms of uh, deferring imaging after a trial of that four weeks of therapy, you're going to get radio radiography if they have weaker risk factors for cancer, uh, signs of ankylosing spondylitis or vertebral compression fracture, and MRI if they have signs or symptoms of radiculopathy or spinal stenosis. All other patients should have no imaging if their back pain has improved after one month trial of therapy, or if they've had spinal imaging in the past and there hasn't been a significant change in their clinical status. Lastly, we are going to look at some of the treatments, and this was a 2017 uh, review paper uh, published in the uh, CMAJ journal. And uh, this is basically all of the treatments that they've looked at and the randomized control trials. And you can see that we talked about bed rest, massage, spinal manipulation, acupuncture, and heat. These are all kind of uh, treatments for acute nonspecific low back pain, which are recommended in the 2017 U.S. guidelines. Exercise, again, and uh, PT and psychologic therapy, not recommended for acute low back pain, but can be considered for your subacute and uh, chronic back pain. And then NSAIDs, again, NSAIDs and muscle relaxants, we do have um, some positive results regarding those treatments, but opioids are not generally recommended. Tylenol is not recommended, uh, given some high quality, quality evidence that it wasn't better than placebo, and systemic steroids are not recommended. Again, this is our approach to low back pain. First, you're going to define the time period, acute, subacute, and chronic. But regardless, you're going to check if there's any red flags. And only patients with red flags should be given imaging, whereas patients without red flags should pursue conservative therapy for four weeks. And you have slightly different treatments based on whether it's acute, subacute, or chronic. I hope this video was useful. Let me know in the comments down below if you have any questions. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.